Hello and welcome again to racers coverage of the 2024 NTT IndyCar Series season and we are at the 8th round the Firestone Grand Prix of Monterey here at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca. It's almost mid-season and yet we are on the brink of change. This is the final time that IndyCar runs with their lightened cars but with no hybrid system. The hybrid system is going to be introduced at Mid-Ohio and it brings a whole new level of complication. To explain exactly how complicated things are going to be for drivers, race engineers, strategists and data acquisition engineers, we spoke to Craig Hampson, Chief Engineer at Andretti Global. Well Craig, this is the last time that these cars race in this spec without, uh, without their hybrid units. What have you as uh, engineer had to do to prepare for the next round while still keeping your cars competitive at uh, this round? Uh, obviously it's going to be a big change. When the uh, hybrid system is integrated into the Indy cars, there is going to be an addition of weight, roughly 100 pounds heavier. Uh, that's going to require more grip to go around the corners or we'll have to go around the corners slower. We'll take more energy to stop the cars. And then there is a huge amount of overhead in managing all the technology around the hybrid system a whole lot of uh, engineering numbers that we have to constantly be thinking about and that the drivers are going to have to be thinking about as they drive. Um, new channels to come across the telemetry, new things that we're logging in the data, temperatures that we have to worry about, efficiencies, voltages, all of those sorts of things. Uh, weight distribution of the car changes. Uh, obviously it's a decent chunk of weight going to the back of the car. That's going to add more load to the rear tires. Typically that'll make the car more neutral, more oversteery, probably on entry. Um, also, I think there's going to be a decent amount more tire degradation due to the added weight, but also the fact that when we're uh, harvesting the energy, regenerating on braking, uh, that tends to lock the rear tires. And then if you deploy early on exit, you, you do add extra load to the, the traction of the rear tires and, and you could have more wheel spin. Right. Now, obviously, there's a lot more for the driver to manage within the cockpit. How much are the race engineers going to have to talk through Hey, you need to shift your brake balance to you know counteract the fact that these rear tires are trying to lock. It's, it's a lot, actually. Um, so the vast majority of hybrid systems out there or electric racing, they have brake by wire. So usually the rear brake circuit is actually done electronically. There's an electric, a computer command that tells them to apply the rear brakes and how much to apply. So with that, they're able to adjust the bias and proportion the braking on the rear axle to suit whatever you're doing with the harvesting, the regeneration of the motor generator unit. IndyCar has chosen not to do that, uh, be it for complication reasons, reliability reasons, cost reasons, I really don't know. But the result is we kind of have a less sophisticated braking system. It's not as smart, so it doesn't know whether you're regenerating or not. So if you try to harvest energy and regenerate, you're effectively moving your brake bias rearwards, and then when you stop doing that, your brake bias moves back forwards again. Can the driver adjust that with the knob, the simple knob and brake bias? Sure, but you can't do it fast enough. Right. And there are complications like if the energy storage system, the capacitors are full of energy, you can't harvest anymore, you can't regenerate. So if in the middle of a braking zone, suddenly everything fills up, suddenly you're gonna have a big shift of brake bias. The result of all of this is you might be more likely to lock a front tire, lock a rear tire, and then what you're going to need is definitely going to vary as the tires start to wear. Uh, some drivers may find it is simply easier just not to regenerate, or at least during the race maybe, because tire wear and tire degradation is going to be a big factor with that. Right. And so is there going to be frantic exchanges between the data acquisition engineers and the race engineers and the strategists to tell their drivers? I, I hope they're not frantic. Um, <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot of overhead, yes, for the drivers, but in particular, I think for the engineers, the systems engineer, the performance engineer, the engine tech, for the race engineer, it is a, a system that is affecting the handling and the balance and the speed of the car. So. There is a lot of, uh, additional that we're, we're having to do with this new system. It's not like a full internal combustion engine, but I'm willing to bet the overhead on it is a good 50% extra over an IC engine. Um, right. And there's a lot of new sort of terms and features that we have to get familiar with. Um, there's a, a lap energy deploy limit that IndyCar has put in place to maintain the durability 
Uh, so that'll be measured in kilojoules. A lot of their talk is in metric units. Right. Um, so there's an amount of kilojoules that we're allowed to use each lap. That is different from track to track, depending upon the length of the track. There is a uh, maximum uh, torque that the MGU can apply or uh, regenerate at. Um, and then there is derating of that torque, which means it'll be something less than the peak torque. And that will happen with differences in temperature, uh, voltage of the energy storage system. So the efficiency varies up and down depending yeah. upon all these different factors. It's like a really big matrix of, of values. Um, and then uh, how do we uh, deploy? Well, deployment is done in IndyCar only by the driver. There's nothing automatic. So the driver has a button. He can either hold the button or he can push it and then let it release it again. Um, he has to decide when to do that. And so the engineers will guide him, but when he's out there battling, he's gonna have to make those choices. In terms of harvesting, regeneration, lots of different options out there. Um, the driver can do that of their own accord. They can use a button or uh, the clutch paddles above 47 miles an hour, they turn into energy harvest paddles and, and they can just decide to harvest energy anytime they want. Let's say you're behind somebody in traffic, but you can't get by them, but you're pretty quick. You can harvest a little energy sitting in the slipstream behind them. Right. Um, but other ways, uh, there is automatic regeneration that can be programmed in by the Honda Tech. That can be uh, a throttle map, uh, off throttle, part throttle. Uh, it also can be a braking map. So we can sculpt very, uh, pretty sophisticated tables of if I'm braking at this amount of pressure, how much regeneration do we want from the rear axle? How much energy harvesting? And like I talked about rear tire degradation, yeah. managing that braking table is gonna be a big part of our job. It's gonna be one set of table for the race, another table for uh, qualifying, and you also have a knob on the steering wheel which enables you to scale all of this. So let's say when the tires have high grip, maybe you'll do all your regeneration. And then as the tire grip starts to wear off through a stint, you'll start backing that knob down so you'll have less rear locking, but you won't be harvesting as much energy on a lap. Right. And uh, how much has been affected by uh, on the ovals by uh, the hybrid system? So the ovals are really busy. Yeah. Uh, the drivers aren't really looking at their dashboard. They're looking ahead at all the different traffic. There's a lot going on, particularly on the short ovals. The workload's really high for them, and they're not able to like stare at their dash and say, oh, you know, I'm fully charged up, I can use it now, or I need to harvest more, like that, that's all really tough. Um, so we're, we're trying to figure out ways that we can do some of that more automatically so they don't have to think about it, um, but they still have to do the deploy themselves. Right. And they can't deploy every straightaway or really even every lap. There isn't enough energy being harvested no. uh, on the entry to the corner with the amount, like sometimes you're flat, right? You yes. never lift off the throttle. Well, you're not harvesting any energy then unless you're actually doing it with the button or the paddle. Um, even when you're off throttle partially or braking a little bit, you're harvesting some energy, but it's not enough to then use it up the next straightaway. So you have to harvest for several laps until you have enough to launch one deploy. It'll probably end up being kind of strategic. Where should I use it? Where, where shouldn't I? We really don't have a whole lot of time running on the ovals. You know, we got the opportunity at Milwaukee a few weeks ago. Yes. That was the first time out for everybody. Yeah. And it's still going to be a, a learning process, I think. Right. And uh, in terms of how often you, uh, uh, you know, get, get to run laps, can you can you build uh, can you build a, a system whereby you can project accurately when how you know how often that's you're going to be able to deploy? Yeah, I mean, do we have that built yet? No, but uh, certainly with the simulation tools available to us with uh, HRC Honda, their driver in the loop simulator, um, this stuff can be simulated in the sim because they put some software in to be able to do that we can practice the stuff. Right. Um, this is gonna take time. I mean, it's brand new for everybody and we will learn each week and what we'll be doing come uh, September at Nashville, we'll be a lot better at it than we will be doing at the first oval race in Iowa. Yeah. Um, but it is complex, it is complicated. This is a whole new world, particularly for those of us who are older and uh, never thought we were gonna be racing uh, electrified cars around. 
Uh, but it's almost here. Uh, yeah. Last internal combustion race this weekend and coming up at Mid-Ohio, the first race of the hybrid era. Final question then, how much of a nightmare is it having it introduced in the middle of the season? It's not ideal. I think certainly the teams would have preferred like to be able to have that mental reset of we're done with one thing yeah. and then we're moving on to something else. I understand why IndyCar did what they did is that they wanted it to be reliable and particularly have a reliable Indy 500. We had a very entertaining Indy 500. It was great. It wasn't compromised by anything. I do think the extra months IndyCar has taken uh, have really improved the reliability of the system. Yeah. You know, my experience the last couple of tests, it's been flawless, it's been easy, we haven't run into any snags. It's just us learning how to use it at this point. It it works, um, you know, just like your, your, your hybrid car or your plug-in hybrid car works at home that you can go and buy from a manufacturer. Uh, this does what it's supposed to do. It's just us trying to figure out, I mean, it works. It makes the car quicker when you, when you deploy it. We just, as engineers, need to figure out how can we be most efficient about it, both in harvesting the energy and deploying the energy. Subscribe to Racer and save 24% off the cover price. You'll get the print and digital editions with an issue archive through 2012. Visit info.racer.com to learn more.